Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today. And um, uh, it's actually quite uh, appropriate, I think, that I follow Mr. Turnbridge, because, uh, or Turnbridge, I should say, is because uh, what he's saying is basically um, what I'm going to be talking about, how to get to that place that he's looking for. So my, my topic is the future of fingerprint analysis, but I'll add a little bit to that title by saying it's the future of fingerprint analysis tools. Mr. Turnage has spoken about the theory and the, the practice of actually conducting a fingerprint comparison using ACE plus V. How do we get to that place? How do we get to the point where we can actually do that in a, in a method that's going to be easy for the, uh, the examiner to accomplish? Well, let's see if we can explain how. Now, I've, I think I've already covered my background, but I'll just add to this that I've basically had 31 years either, either as a fingerprint examiner, a supervisor of fingerprint examiners, and now writing software for fingerprint examiners. And I'm gonna start with, with something that has been the bane of my life for basically half of my career. The magnifying glass, as the Americans call, some Americans call it the loop glass. Now, this is, this is actually a picture of my actual glass that I still have in my cupboard. And I use this, uh, uh, like I said, for most of my early career. And it's a good reason why it's being used is because it's very easy to use. It requires little training, and I'll add to that no training, because I received no training in the use of this thing. I was just given one, and I proceeded to use it from then on. It's effective. It's very inexpensive, really, compared to a lot of other things. And it just happens to be very bad for the health of the user. And I'll explain why. This gentleman here was one of my team members when I was working with the Australian Federal Police. And he's using his particular brand of the uh, magnifying glass. It's probably a little bit up market from the one I used to use. And I can tell you now that I had many complaints from my staff for many years before, prior to uh, introducing a digital solution for neck and back pain, which was probably the main uh, complaint I had from my staff members. And it, it resulted on, in quite a bit of time off from the work, workplace because of that. And you can see why, but I'll go into that a little bit more closely in a few other slides. And I'll come to eye strain. Now, the magnifying glass is not a natural thing to look through for hours on end. And I can tell you that because my personal experience was that I developed terrible eye strain and headaches from these devices. And in fact, I took, when I took over from the Australian Federal Police, it was at a time when the accreditation process was really taking off big time in 2005. We were accredited just uh, but one of those accreditation requirements was to review cases. There was a technical review case and there was an administration review that was required as part of the process. And I was the officer in charge of 20 examiners and I reviewed most of those cases on a daily basis uh, for the technical reviews, which means I had to look down a magnifying glass for much of that time. I was spending maybe four to five hours looking down a magnifying glass. Now I have to tell you, I'm quite fit. I used to run, I used to play squash, I went to the gym, but it didn't save me from terrible, terrible eye strain. And I, I suffered pretty badly from that. And I was looking for a new career, in fact. <laughs> and, um, and so I'll, I'll explain what happened that uh, precipitated the, the, the digital solution I came up with. But that was one of the main ones. It was my, I was trying to save my own career, basically. The other thing is that you don't understand how fatigued you can be when you have to, uh, to keep yourself in that posture for many, hours, many, many hours on end. It is quite fatiguing, and, uh, and, it's, and it's also, a co of course, by the look of that photograph, it's going to be bad for your, for your back and neck. It is slow compared to the digital solutions out there, and it is inefficient. You can see this gentleman is actually working on an actual case. It's a major, major crime. And you can see his desk is absolutely covered in latent images, either 10 print forms or photographs or actual latents lifted from the crime scene. 
that's pretty typical for those days um, in 2005-ish and before that. It was quite inefficient. Now, I'm just going to go through a series of photographs to show you why it is that people suffer badly from this particular posture. And I really don't even have to uh, explain it. Your head is very heavy. You have to hold that head up, uh, hold that head at an angle for hours on end, and it's just not good for you. There, I don't know why, how we got away with it with all the oh and stuff going on these days for as long as we have. Uh, that's ridiculous. And we all did it uh, in those days, and uh, we never thought much of it. And we just took the complaints from staff and the days off as part of the part of the the normal working environment. We did try a few things, like this posture was uh, improved a bit by these um, these raised platforms, um, but it was, it was still subpar, and you still you still had to look down through a magnifying glass. And that, that is, that's going to uh, wreck your eyes in time. And my right eye is now my bad eye. That's the eye I used to use for magnifying glasses. Now my left eye, which was my weak eye, is my good eye. So, and I think that will be the same for me for the rest of my career. And, um, and, and I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. Now, the digital comparisons can be done in a much better uh, position. I mean, it's, it's, it's still not a perfect uh, situation, but it's far, far better than the magnifying glass or, or anything like it uh, because of the posture you can maintain in a chair and looking straight ahead to the screen to look at your fingerprints. So how did we, um, how did we come up with the solution that I'm gonna describe shortly? Well, a couple of things came to be a thing in the around about 2000. Most people had personal computers on their desks by then. The monitors became very good. Um, it was around about 2005 where you could get relatively inexpensive high definition monitors. And that was a big thing. Digital cameras had been around for a while, but they had really sort of took over around about that time. And all the departments, all the police departments moved to digital cameras. Everything was digital. Everything was being moved around as a, as a uh, onto um, uh, drives, you know, major central drives for these fingerprints to be used um, uh, on the personal computers. The only thing that was actually missing was specialized fingerprint comparison tools. And in 2005, I was looking around for something like that. And there were some very, very poor things on the, on the market that nobody wanted to use. Uh, understandably, they were just too difficult to, to manage. And we had Photoshop. Uh, and Photoshop really had some uh, things missing that were required to make this a success. And one of the most basic things of all was to have the split screen where you could put an unknown in one screen and the known in the other. And now that sounds very basic, but there wasn't just anything out there at that time. So luckily for me, uh, because I wasn't a point of, at the point of changing my, my career path, I really did want to stay in fingerprints because when it, fingerprints grabs you as a profession, it really doesn't like to let go. And, uh, and, and so I had to find a solution. And luckily at, my, at that time, my son, who was doing a, um, who was a, a software engineer, came up with a solution that saved the day. Now, these tools, you can actually see what we came up with on this, this monitor. And this is about 2006. And this lady is one of my team members. And I issued everybody with dual screens um, and I issued the, them with a scanner so that they could scan, scan anything that was still in a physical format like lifters or photographs directly onto a drive. And, um, we, we developed this thing that was a uh, several tools in one, if you like. And we had to sort of overcome uh, one obstacle from the beginning is that we had a lot of um, experienced examiners that I was worried that they may not want to change from their magnifying glass, even though it was causing them all sorts of health issues. They may not like to change. It's a sort of, 
it's it's kind of like um, part of nature is that the longer you like you do something, the less you're likely to want to change. So I needed to overcome this this reluctance to change to a, a new way of doing things, and so I had to make it as easy to use as possible, easier even than using a magnifying glass. And we did mention, manage to accomplish that after much trial and error. And we introduced that um, tool in 2006 across the Australian Federal Police. It was about 20 examiners. And um, so when I say um, several tools at once uh, in one application, it, it's, an, it's an analogy would be the, the mobile phone. The mobile phone has many different uh, tools within it now. Hundreds of different things you can do on your mobile phone. The trend in, in, in the technologies today is to consolidate all of the things you want in one application. So we brought together all of the digital needs, if you like, of the fingerprint examiner, and we put that into one application. And, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute of what I'm talking about. You had to be able to display the image in a way that was done easily. You had to be able to sort of drop the images in there quickly and easily. And, uh, and then you had to zoom in and orientate them quickly with the very simple movements of the mouse or, or such. You had to be able to enhance the image. Now, my, one of my competitors is the, is the Photoshop, but the Photoshop is, is the proverbial sledgehammer to crack a nut. If you've ever used that application, uh, it has many, many hundreds of different things you can do with an image. But within the fingerprint field, there's only, you know, really half a dozen of those that you really ever use. You may, if you get a guru within your section who's right into Photoshop, they could find a few more. But most of your staff will probably only use half a dozen of those tools. So this has taken those tools and put them into the application. So you don't have to worry about getting any specialist enhancement tools. They're already there in the application. The other thing is uh, comparison markup. Now, uh, Mr. Turnish has gone and um, described the need for note taking or annotation. And I was very cognizant of that need. And so we put some very good tools into the software so that you can easily annotate your analysis of the fingerprint. And, um, and then you can uh, print out that analysis in a report form that looks professional. It looks impressive to the courts. A lot of what you do in court, it, it's important to demonstrate your, your expertise. But as part of that, you've got to be able to look the part, you've got to be able to show them the documentation that looks impressive. It's, it's, it's not just part of the theater, it's part of your professionalism as you demonstrate that to the courts and such. So this is one way of doing that quickly and easily. And it has charting and you can include charts as part of the report. And some agencies don't use charts at all, but it, it's what's expected from the courts that you have to deliver. And if the court expects a chart, you deliver a chart. And if they expect a report, you deliver a report that's impressive looking. And it's, it doesn't just show the workings of what you've done. It does it in a, in, a, in a professional and impressive manner. And you have to be able to save those images and those comparisons and your work to a, to a case management system or, or print it out and include it into a physical case. But it has to be done easily and that this software does that and that recently well not that recently about four years ago we we added a, an APHIS component now one of the things that I had difficulty with as the officer in charge of the fingerprint section was that much of what we do is looking looking for that that image that has the same features as the one we're looking you know our our, our template or our um, as our 10 prints or our suspect or, or something like that. So looking for, to, to um, uh, account for all the outstanding latents in the case file is extremely important. You don't want to turn up at court and have them say, 
well, what about this late? You didn't identify that. That might be the real offender. What about that one? So you've got to go through each of these uh, case, these latents from the crime scene, these crime scene fingerprints, and do your best to try and account for them so that they've been that they have been at least uh, attempted to be identified. So we've included an APHIS within the application. So you can quickly check against all your suspects, your uh, elimination prints, your, um, your suspect prints. And uh, if you may have a selection of um, uh, uh, criminals who are working in that particular field, for instance, a drugs job where you have known offenders in the area, you might have a separate database of those offenders that you can check against. So we have a little, uh, what's called a case APHIS. And you can put up to 500 of those um, uh, suspects into a case APHIS and search it against them. We can do much bigger APHISs as well. We can do national, county, state APHISs as well. But at the moment, our biggest seller is the, the case APHIS where we can deal with a uh, large number of, of, of suspect prints quickly against the outstanding latents. And it has to run, all of this runs on a standard PC. <coughs> Excuse me. It has to be able to run on a standard PC and not have specialized equipment. A few times I've been uh, a, a, you know, visiting my colleagues in the United States. They have three APHISs in their, the, the wealthier counties have their own APHIS. They have a state APHIS and they have a federal APHIS, and they're all dedicated PCs on a desk somewhere. It's an enormous, you know, um, uh, it, it takes up a lot of space and a lot of resources to house that kind of uh, number of APHISs. This software includes it all within the standard PC that's on somebody's desk or in front of your, your, um, your the, um, uh, the PCs of your examiners. So before I, I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm going to push on and show you this software to show you the, 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 the ingredients I believe the future analysis tools must have to replace the, um, the magnifying glass or any, any other kind of series of uh, applications that get to that end. So I'll just start that now. I'll just get out of my presentation and open up my software. Now you'll see on the left screen here that I have uh, the applications open. I've got a couple of fingerprints in there, but I'll just get rid of those for a second and I'll show you what is the rule number one for these particular types of software. Uh, and John, that is, I'm yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think your screen is not shared. Uh, still we are able to view the PPT screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll start again then. Yeah, it's visible now. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, guys. Or I'll start again. Um, the the applications on the left side of your screen, and you can see there's two large blank screens: the left and the right, the unknown on the left, the known on the right. A space for those particular fingers. Now you must it must be uh, easy to use. It has to be so easy to use. There's going to be no opposition for anybody to take it on. And by the by, um, when I was introducing this software, my fears of, of you know, some of the older uh, technicians accepting it were completely unfounded. Many of them immediately saw that they needed to do something about their health, and this is one way of doing it. In one case, one guy was on the brink of, of, being, of retiring. He was in his early 50s, and he was in a state because he still had, had his unit to pay off. And he wanted to be able to extend his, his working life, but couldn't. His back was just giving him too much trouble. This saved him that and extended his working life by about 10 years. But that was just a, a side issue. Now, it's got to be easier than a magnifying glass. So I'll, I'll demonstrate of, by placing a fingerprint into the screen. I left click on my mouse and I drag it and put it into the, the application. And then I might do the same with the set of 10 prints and down here and I drag it across and put it into the right side. And I'm just going to uh, maximize the screen. And the other thing you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to position the image so that you can see it in the right orientation and the right zoom. And this is easily done by just lift clicking and moving around and then using the scroll button to zoom in. 
And you can zoom right in until the pixelation becomes too bad. And you can do that on both sides. And I happen to know that this one is the same there. So I'm just going to zoom in on that. So that might seem that might seem basic, but it is it is the core of what these software, um, this these kind of comparison software must have before it is of any use at all. And then when you have uh, uh, Moving from other images, say if you want to look at another latent, you can drag it across there and look at that latent and then zoom in closely. And the other feature here is you can go next. So that next button that I just pre pressed takes you to the next image in the folder. Also very important. Typically, you'll get several latents from the crime scene and they'll be scanned or they'll, have, they'll be digital images and they'll be placed into a folder on your case file. And you can go to the folder with all of the crime scene fingerprints and you can bring up the first one. And then from then on, you can use this tool to just quickly go through the latents in that folder. Now, again, typically you'll look for the best image. Well, that's what everybody does. They look for the best image so they, because then they'll have the best chance of getting a hit if they try to search it or try to, <coughs> to match it against an, a, a suspect's prints. So you just go down quickly to find out the best print. And I'm just going to stick with this one because I know that it's matching the one in the right. It's just easier. Now, the other thing you want to be able to have these things do is to be doing the Photoshop thing. So I'm just going to add some prints that I know uh, require Photoshopping. Well, you may be able to work with this, this particular print without Photoshopping, but we'll just for demonstration purposes say, well, one on the left here, we want to make sure it is the best image possible for comparison purposes. I'll keep the image on the right so you can give it, you can see what I've done directly to the image. One of the things we've got on here is called the invert, and it just inverts the image colors to the opposite colors. This is particularly useful if you want to use the black and white thing here. This is the saturation tool. You can take all the color out. If I hit the invert now, it just makes it white on black. Towards the end of my time with the Australian Federal Police, I did this to all my images because I was suffering from a bit of glare from the, from the monitors. So I just changed everything to white on black. So basically you were looking mostly at a black screen with the white images against it. Much easier for you to do comparisons. But you also may want to, if you've got gray powder or white color powder on, a, on an object, you might want to turn it uh, invert the colors so you're comparing black ridges to the black ridges that'll be on your set of 10 prints or your uh, rec record prints. And, and then it's got all the other tools that you normally use in this thing, which is uh, brightness and contrast. Uh, and you can do all the contrast stuff. There's also a sharpen tool. And you can reset everything back to the original by just pressing the button. And um, there is a, a flip button here too. You might want to uh, uh, horizontally uh, or laterally reverse the image so that perhaps it's, if you've taken a set of fingerprints from a, a deceased person, you can reverse those images. So you're comparing those to a set of temperance, for instance. But there's also transfer issues. If you, trans if you end up transferring a set of prints, if you've got a transfer issue, say on a plastic bag, which is the most common, uh, transfer issue, uh, you can reverse the image and, and see that if you can get a match that way. So it's got all of the basic tools that you need for the enhancement processes. And once you've, once you've got the best image you can, I might just go back to one of these images here. And I'll put in a set of temperance that I had before. All right. I'll just try. Now you might. Well, what if you need to start? This is where I, uh, where this, the tools we have here might be useful for things that Mr. Turnge was talking about before, which is annotation and report making. And the first thing you need to do is to be able to mark up the image. So I'm going to position it. Oh, by the way, there is a tool here where you can match zoom as well. The match zoom act. Uh, looks at both images and makes them the, the, the same uh, scale so that you 
you're comparing like to like. It just makes it quick. I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that again. Oh, I just zoom right out to the set of 10 prints and I'll just go map zoom and it brings it straight in so that you can see the image in the same scale. Now, this is where we get to where we start marking up the features. Now, typically you might mark up a feature by starting with the unknown. In fact, if you're gonna to be uh, totally um, uh, doing it the right way, you should remove the set of 10 prints altogether. So you're not looking at it. And what you start with is, is the unknown on the left and you make all the notes, notes that you can, well, <coughs> excuse me, during the analysis process. And then you look at the set of 10 prints, but you know, we won't get too, too um, down that road at the moment. So I'm just gonna start marking it up. And you can see it's a red dot. Now, if I wanna change that to a gyro color, I can change it just there. So I've determined that this is a high quality uh, uh, feature, and then I can move on to the next one. And I can keep going around the, the, um, uh, the, the image and, and, and set the quality for each one. So you might consider this for argument's sake, you might consider this uh, a yellow, but you can uh, also while you're going say, well, I think this is a, um, a ridge ending. Uh, in fact, it's actually a bifurcation. So I'll put in a bifurcation as a, as a, a type of feature. And you can keep going around doing this for each of these features. So I won't, I won't labor that point. I'll just demonstrate by marking up a few of these features. And then you might turn to your uh, set of 10 prints. I might just match that, zoom that again, and do the same thing. And you can start marking them up in the same way. Hopefully I can, <laughs> uh, what have I done here? Okay. That one there, that one there. Yeah, so I'll just start marking these up. Ooh, look that there. And that one there, that one there, that one there. There. No one there. Okay, so you might get to a place here, having done all of the features in the uh, making, marking up with the quality, uh, setting their quality. In fact, all of these are basically pretty good. So I'm going to mark them all green. And these ones are too. And quite often you'll find in the, when you're working with uh, the, you know, most of the latents and the, and the temperance will be pretty high quality because you'll start with the most high quality first. You, you could make an argument, some of these are might be yellow, but I'm not gonna to get too much into that. So when you get to a point where you want to um, uh, uh, do a chart or anything like that, you can go to the reporting page. Now this, I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm not gonna talk about some of these other tools. You can draw on it, you can do other things, so, but I'll, I'll stick to the basics at the moment. Now you get to a point where you might want to do a chart. So I'm just going to hit auto chart. Now all of these now have been have come up into the this border. I'm just going to increase, increase the bar, margin size a little bit. So it's down there. And you can reduce the size of the of the numbers on there as well. You can see some of these are not quite uh, adding up. So I'm just going to move that across there. And you can see, well, okay, what well, the numbers don't quite go in the right order there. So in fact, it makes more sense for this to be down there than up the top. So I'll just move that down there. I'm gonna mark this one down here. Just move it down a bit more. And now the numbers are all sort of all over the place. So all I hit now is auto number. So all the numbers around the outside are in the right order, but maybe you don't like numbers. Maybe you like letters. So I'll change it to letters instead. Okay, now this is very quick. I mean, you'd have more time to do it <laughs> properly. But then, well, what, what I need to do now is to put that into a Word document for my, my case file. So you bring up a hit copy and you bring up a chart template and then you uh, paste it and you've got yourself a, 
a chart that you can add to your, your um, case file. Now, and you can sign it off as, as a first fingerprint examiner, that sort of thing, and add it to the case file, which is what we did with the Australian Federal Police. But what if you want to, you know, include notes and things like that? I'm just going to reduce that size. Oh, I might just make that. Yeah, that's better. Uh, what if you want to do a report? Well, there's a report page here. And on this report page, it's got things like clarity and type. Now, I haven't actually marked the type, but if I wanted to mark the type there, I could go and what if I just mark all of the all of them as regenerates. I know they're not, but just for you know for brevity purposes, we'll make mark them all as reg endings. Okay. So all of these reg endings will come up in this list here on the type. And you can write notes in there as well. Uh, so you can write additional notes. And up here you can include the uh, the the chart in the report. Now this report can then be printed out into a Word document, and then you can include that in your case notes. So this is basically a tool that accomplishes some of what Mr. Turnish was trying to achieve in his report. And it gives you a way of doing it quickly and easily and in a digital format. Well, you can print it out as well as, as in a, if you need to print it out as, a, as an actual document. So, that's quickly, I'm sort of taking up a bit more time than I really needed to, I suppose. But if I've got a bit more time, I think I've got a few minutes, hopefully. What I'll do is I'll demonstrate the APHIS side of things. So what I'll do is I'll take out the images there and I will demonstrate the case APHIS. Now this particular um, uh, label up here is for the APHIS. Now, if I want to search a fingerprint, I have to add a latent. So I'm going to add this one here since we've been using that. You put that into the, into the left screen and then you just hit search and it automatically searches an internal database. You can have as many databases as you want and it'll come up with all of the, um, of the candidates. And up the top here, it'll give you a score. And because it's such a high score, it's also giving you a little green tick it doesn't necessarily mean it's a miss though. In this case, it's the maximum score. So I double click onto that and it'll come up into the right screen and you can start doing your, your comparison, your analysis and your comparisons if you like. Uh, so you can just start marking things up and then moving on to your set of temperance and, and conducting your ACE plus B if that's the route you want to go. Um, it's, it's quick, it's easy, and you can create as many databases as you want. So it's, and the other thing too, you can, if you don't know the orientation, say this is upside down and you have no idea what the orientation would be. I'll just get rid of those images again and add another image. This one here will do. I'm going to turn this upside down and I'm going to zoom in a bit. Okay. And then I'm going to hit 360 search. It takes a little bit longer. Um, but it's still very, very quick compared to what the manual processes are. Well, I've got four hits here. I'll just bring up the, the first image. And there we go. All right, there we go. So I'll turn that right side way up. And you can see it's hit against one of the, the flats on the, on the set of ten print uh, form. It, it would have hit also hit against the set of uh, the the um, the rolls as well. So I'll just bring up the roll and see if I can. Okay, it's just hit against the flat again. So the flat seems to be hitting against it better for some reason. So there we go. The 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 uh, in basically in summary, what we're doing is we're being all of the the tools that you may possibly want to use as a fingerprint examiner and we're putting it in, in the application. And we're gonna be putting out uh, versions of this software in the next six months that bring in a lot more of these types of tools. The, I'll just go to my, back to my presentation and down to the bottom here. Yeah, so now 
I'll have to get some. Can you see that okay? Okay, I just assume you do. Now, the the future versions of the software. I'm just going to make that up. Uh, there we go. The future versions of this software. I think the key after bringing all of the applications together that you could possibly use in an image uh, setting is to uh, allow for automation. So that we're going to seek to automate the the image enhancement, and we can do that using artificial intelligence. The other thing we want to be able to do is, is to search uh, more accurately and much, much bigger uh, APHISes, um, national type APHIS sizes, using, again, that kind of technology. And we'll be adding additional enhancement tools as well in order to um, uh, uh, bring out the best possible, we'll probably be including some of the stuff that you see on Photoshop now, but you rarely use, but somebody might want to use. So I'll be adding those kind of tools. The tool that I'm, I'm basically thinking on here is too, is the um, deconvol deconvolution tool. Uh, that tool is where, say you've got a Coke can with a red lettering on a white background. It, it, uh, it makes, with a, a fingerprint image on it, it makes the entire image red or white so that you can more easily see that uh, fingerprint. That's just one of many of the enhancement tools we'll be including later on this year. So uh, that concludes my presentation.